tonight on CBC Vancouver News. The court process uh, in this case has been long. The investigation has been long. 40 years later, a guilty verdict for the man who killed a young BC girl also. The counter argument is, dear speculator, please identify yourself. Form frustration. The BC NDP tries to defend its speculation tax exemption requirements and... Tears and confusion. A bizarre backtrack from the former Liberal candidate forced to resign over racial remarks. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. After 40 years, the family of a 12-year-old girl killed in Merritt has finally gotten justice. This afternoon, a jury found Gary Handlin guilty of first-degree murder in the death of Monica Jack. As the CBC's Tina Lovegreen tells us, it was an emotional day in the courtroom. The victim's family members held each other in tears, awaiting the verdict. And when the verdict finally came down, the courtroom erupted in cheers and applause upon hearing Gary Hanlon was found guilty of first-degree murder in the death of 12-year-old Monica Jack in 1978. Elated, you know, when you wait 40 years to have justice. This woman was hugging the family in court and said today was a good day. Uh, justice has been done in so many ways that, 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 that uh, it's quite a relief. It's quite a relief. The family didn't want to make any comments until after the sentencing, but were relieved to hear the word guilty. Thank you. Monica Jack was last seen riding her bike near Merritt in 1978. Her remains were discovered in the area 17 years later. Gary Hanlon later became the focus of a so-called Mr. Big Sting in 2014 and confessed on a hidden camera to abducting, sexually assaulting and killing Monica Jack. He pleaded not guilty, his lawyer arguing Hanlon is a notorious liar and was just boasting about the murder, trying to fit in with the fictitious criminal organization. And that Hanlon got the details about the murder from police and the media. That didn't convince the jury of nine men and three women. They found Hanlon guilty 40 years after the crime. The investigation has been long. Um, we appreciate the jury for, for their uh, time and consideration with respect to this matter and for all of those who were involved in bringing this case to this stage. First-degree murder carries an automatic life sentence with no eligibility for parole for 25 years. But sentencing will still take place, so Monica Jack's loved ones can read their victim impact statements on January 28th. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Opt out or pay the provincial speculation and vacancy tax by default. That's the new reality for 1.6 million homeowners in B.C. There's been widespread backlash this week over the tax exemption paperwork. But as our provincial affairs reporter Tanya Fletcher tells us, the province is defending the process. If you own a home blanketed by B.C.'s new speculation and vacancy tax, this is the exemption notice you'll soon receive in the mail. And if you don't fill it out, you'll automatically be taxed. Criticism has been quick, with many taking to Twitter wondering why they suddenly have to prove they're not a speculator. The counter argument is, dear speculator, please identify yourself. And I'm not confident that that's the most effective way to identify speculation. Citizens fill out homeowner grants every year. You have to tick the box and send it back to get your homeowner grant. But the Green Party leader says there's a key difference. The difference is, if you don't go online, you're just not getting something. They're not taking something from you. In this negative billing, if you don't do it, they're taking something from you. So who does this affect? Homeowners in Greater Victoria, Nanaimo, the Lower Mainland, and the Kelowna area will all receive the declaration notice. The province says 99% of those people won't have to pay the tax. The opposition says that's not the point. To inconvenience 99% of uh, folks that are in those affected areas in order to try and capture the 1%, uh, it's just an administrative burden that uh, is uh, really unfortunate. For couples whose names are both on the land title, each person has to fill out a separate form. As for alternatives, this housing expert believes pre-screening could have been an option. 
and there the province could have looked at your tax records, uh, possibly driver's license, uh, ICBC, et cetera, and said, this looks like somebody who lives there uh, year-round. This is their primary residence. There is also concern about the confusion this negative billing could create. If we think about the senior citizen that uh, may miss the notice in the mail, uh, to find out that they're going to get hammered by this new tax. Uh. The government insists the form only takes 10 to 20 minutes to fill out, but if you don't get it in by March 31st, you can expect a tax notice in July. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, Vancouver's so-called Prince of Pot is defending himself against allegations of sexual impropriety. Mark Emery addressed a number of complaints leveled against him on social media. CBC's Dan Burrett is looking into this for us tonight. Dan, what's Emery saying exactly? Anita, Mike, his statement comes after an Ontario journalist claims Emery was inappropriate with her at his cannabis culture store here in Vancouver years ago. The Twitter post sparked a controversy on social media and triggered a huge response and other allegations. Deirdre Olson says she was 17 when she met Emery in 2008. She said Emery was at the height of his fame as the so-called Prince of Pot, as you mentioned, and she says she was starstruck. Olson, who grew up in Ladner, says he once invited her to smoke pot from an oversized phallic bong and said explicit things to her. She said her mother stopped her from taking a job at the pot shop. Emery acknowledges he had, quote, five to eight 17-year-old friends in 2014 and 2015 that he smoked marijuana with after returning from prison. We have to stress Olson's statements are allegations posted online. CBC News has not fully investigated nor verified the allegations in those claims. We did ask Mark Emery for an interview today. He's yet to get back to us. Anita, Mike? Dan Burrett reporting live tonight. Thanks. Well, it's another strange turn for ousted Liberal candidate Karen Wang. Wang resigned her candidacy in the Burnaby South by-election yesterday over racial comments, only to attempt today to revive it. As Naked Bachelor reports, there were tears and confusion as she was turned away from her own news conference. By all accounts, it looked like business as usual on the Burnaby South campaign trail today. Let's focus on what we can do to make the community better, what we can do to represent Burnaby South, what we can do to solve some of the problems that people are facing. NDP candidate Jagmeet Singh trying to put racial messaging by his former opponent behind him. On Wednesday, it came out formal Liberal candidate Karen Wang sent a WeChat message to constituents pointing out Singh's background. The 43-year-old resigned, but by this morning, she had a change of heart, and so she called a news conference to clear things up. It did anything but. The first problem? She wanted to have a press conference at the Metro Town Library in Burnaby. Library and city staff weren't notified, and when the press arrived, the head librarian told Wang she couldn't hold her political event on public library grounds. There were tears. <laughs> and confusion. As Wang and her family found a spot for the event, they settled in the parking lot. Recently, I have been labeled as a racist, and which really, really makes me hurt. And I feel like I am abused, and I am insulted, and this is not me at all. I am not a racist. She went on to explain that her pointing out Singh's background is a conventional way of communicating in Chinese culture. When you see news um, um, on, on Chinese uh, media and uh, when they talk about candidates, they always point out uh, people's like uh, ethnic group uh, background. In her liberal red, she appealed to the federal liberals to reinstate her, but the party stood by its decision. Wang is now considering whether or not to run as an independent. The deadline for that decision is February 4th. Megan Batchelor, CBC News, Vancouver. The RCMP is asking for your help in identifying the man who assaulted a 14-year-old girl yesterday in Surrey's Tynehead neighborhood. Police say the suspect followed the teen into Bel Air Park on 157th Street at about 4.15. He grabbed her on the shoulder from behind, but she was able to flee after kicking him. He's described as a white male wearing a black hoodie, gray sweatpants, and black shoes. She is okay, there were no injuries, uh, but as you could uh, imagine, she's uh, a little shaken up. The youth unit, along with our frontline officers, with members from some other, of our other um, support units, will be um, increasing patrols before and after schools in the Surrey area. Investigators are hoping to talk to anyone who was in that area between 3 and 5 p.m. 
who might have dash cam footage or other information. Those hoping to stay anonymous can, of course, contact Crime Stoppers. Sweeping reforms are coming to B.C.'s logging industry. Premier John Horgan has announced plans to limit the number of raw logs exported overseas. It's an attempt to buck a decades-long trend that's seen more and more trees sent overseas. Horgan says there will be incentives for companies wanting to process raw logs. What those incentives will be has not yet been finalized, but there could be increased fees for exports. The announcement brings hope to those in the industry, but also comes with some doubts. One of the challenges we have with changing log export policy and bringing the, the fiber back into our domestic market is that there are no actually markets for, uh, there's no domestic processing facilities that will be able to utilize that fiber. There's no, and there's no market, so that's, that's the big question mark. How will it happen? How will we make it economical to harvest marginal stands? The new reforms will be rolling out over the next two years. A restaurant in East Vancouver is closing Sunday, less than a month after a rat was allegedly found in a bowl of soup served to a customer. Crab Park Chowdhury announced the closure in an Instagram post last night. On December 29th, a video posted by a customer showed what appeared to be a dead rat inside a bread bowl of soup. Health inspectors visited the cafe to investigate and ultimately allowed it to stay open. Chowdhury has since said the rat incident couldn't have and did not happen. A pilot project that kept more addicted patients in treatment is expanding across the province. The goal is to help clinics identify people at risk, uh, ensure uh, that they get on treatment and support them with that if they need more expertise, and strategies to help keep people on treatment. And the initiative uses the same strategy that helped drive down the province's HIV and AIDS rates. Initial results show more than double the number of drug addicted people stayed in treatment Retaining people who are addicted to opioids in treatment is the biggest hurdle in preventing deaths related to the overdose crisis. Well, it's expected to be a sellout crowd. Former U.S. President Barack Obama is coming to Vancouver. Hosted by the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade, a conversation with Barack Obama is happening on March 5th. The Board of Trade says Obama is currently one of the most coveted speakers in the world. Board of Trade members get first dibs on tickets, and any that are left over will be made available to the public. Interesting to see how many of those might be left over, but... I don't think too many, yeah, and if there good, are, they'll sell out pretty quickly. They would, yeah. Good get for the Board of Trade. Uh, mm -hmm. President Clinton was here, of course, last year, and mm -hmm. now President Obama. And Michelle Obama, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, time for our first look at the forecast. Johanna Wagstaff is here, and as you said, the rain has arrived. Yes, it has. Round, I think, two of four we've got going on over the next couple of days. But things are coming in rounds, so we will get some breaks out there. But yes, starting to see the heavy stuff fill in right now. Quick look at the temperatures. 10 at YVR, much milder start to the day. We didn't have that uh, frost to kick things off. We are now well into that southwesterly flow. Seven out towards Pitt Meadows, a six at Abbotsford, 12 just across the border. There are the showers moving in on the radar. You can see the heavy stuff back towards the island. Uh, Sydney uh, towards Campbell River and back in through Nanaimo, seeing those heavier downpours right now. This line is tracking across the strait and will fill in across Metro Vancouver in the next couple of hours. So uh, really the showers we saw today, a prelude to the heavier stuff tonight. We could end up with a good 10 to 30 millimeters through the overnight, all being directed by a couple of centers of low pressure that'll skirt up the coast. So the first one moving uh, off the north end of Vancouver Island, that's what brought the showers this morning, the center of the next low still south of the border, and that will continue to bring rain over the next couple of days. It's a mild evening, as I mentioned, really not dipping down below four or five tonight. I think we will see another break, just like we had today around midday. Cloudy, keeping the risk for a few showers in there, but the next round of heavy stuff, once we get through the overnight morning rain, uh, will be towards the late afternoon. So a uh, repeat Friday to the Thursday we've had. I didn't put the sunshine in, but I'm not ruling out a midday break. All right, Johanna, thanks very much. Talk to you in a bit. Sounds good. Now, as you might be aware, tonight is Throwback Thursday. Yeah. Every week we dig into our archives for a blast from the past. But if you want to see those stories, of course you do. It's Throwback Thursday. Uh -huh. You have to be watching with us online. So join us and the conversation on the day's top stories on YouTube, Facebook, and cbc.ca slash bc. Well, a warning from China's ambassador to Canada saying tensions between the two countries will likely escalate. I'll tell you what China's demanding right after the break.
Hello to everyone watching our live stream tonight. We are kicking it old school for this edition of Throwback Thursday. Who doesn't love that? Uh -huh. uh, in almost every sense of the phrase, we are kicking it old school. Yes. Back in 1986, Vancouver was introduced to a first-of-its-kind school, the goal to teach students a few tricks to help them achieve their pipe dreams. Former CBC reporter Bob Gillingham dropped in while class was in session. Anyone over 30 probably thinks this is a warm-up for a trip to the emergency ward. But in fact, it's a school for skateboarders, the first ever in Vancouver. John Krieger and Steve Corcoran are holding it at the Kitsilano Community Center. We're trying to teach these kids um, some of the ground rules of safety, uh, good board handling, and uh, just upgrade their board skills. Now John is the envy of all. Just look at him on the board. He wants to turn pro and make it into the big time. Basically turning pro means that you endorse uh, your own skateboard model and you can accept professional prize money which is up, up to $1,000 a contest for the big contests. But when you're top dog, there's always a challenger. Eight-year-old Michael Johnstone hasn't been on the boards long, but he's got some big ideas. How good would you like to get? Real good. Pretty pro. Would you like to get as good as John? Yeah. yeah I don't think he's going to make it. Maybe. You think you're going to be better than he is someday? Yeah. Definitely. Who knows? One of them just might make it. But in the meantime, it's back to class. You have to pay your dues first. Bob Gillingham, CBC News. Love Bob Gillingham. And you gotta also right. love the fact that they're <laughs> teaching all the safety rules, but there's no helmets. No helmets. It was a different time. It was uh -huh. a different. Was that when skateboarding was really? Was it just taking off? I think so. I think it was, yeah, but it's it was gone nice. through kind of phases, right? Yeah. So, yeah. were you ever a skateboarder? No, I just couldn't. I couldn't get the hang of it. Not that coordinated, apparently. We can bring someone in, teach you a few skills. Sure, we'll get right on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if you enjoyed that story, you can let us know directly by tweeting us. Our Twitter handles are on the screen right now. Uh, be sure to give us your feedback in the comments on both YouTube and Facebook as well. We will be back with more news right here on CBC Vancouver in just a few moments. Canadian officials are condemning the killing of a Halifax mining executive in Burkina Faso. Foreign Affairs Minister Christia Freeland says the crime shouldn't go unpunished. This is a terrible, uh, it's a terrible crime and Canada is absolutely committed to working with the authorities in Burkina Faso to bring those responsible to justice. Kirk Woodman was abducted by gunmen on Tuesday night. He was Working at a mining site owned by Canada's Progress Minerals near the border with Niger, his body was found yesterday and identified by colleagues. Burkina Faso recently declared a state of emergency in the area after repeated attacks by extremists. Woodman's family says not a day will go by that he won't be missed. The Prime Minister gathered his newly revamped cabinet in Sherbrooke, Quebec today. It's the start of a three-day retreat to deal with pressing issues and set the course for this fall's federal election. The Liberals are hoping to make electoral gains in Quebec, but on the key issue of immigration, they don't see eye to eye with the province's new premier, Francois Legault. The CBC's David Cochran reports. If Justin Trudeau wants to keep his job, he likely has to win big in Quebec. So a good relationship with the new premier can only help. I won't uh, support any uh, uh, fiddle party, uh, but uh, I will be clear with our demands, and I hope that uh, most of these demands will be accepted by as many, uh, by as many uh, parties as possible. 
Francois Legault won't be endorsing the Liberals or anyone else, but he is willing to work with them. Though Quebec has a list of ideas that could be politically difficult to meet. I hope that they be uh, clear on accepting that Quebec government gets more power in terms of choosing our immigrants. Immigration will be the area where they are most at odds. The Liberals have made it a national policy to boost immigration levels. But Legault wants to reduce immigration in Quebec by 20 percent, even though the Quebec economy is suffering from labor shortages. Businesses in Drummondville earlier this week told me they're literally refusing contracts and not accepting sales because they do not have enough employees to properly complete the contract. It will be a delicate balancing act for LeBlanc and his colleagues as they make their pitch to Quebec voters. The cabinet is in Sherbrooke because it's in a cluster of ridings where the NDP came first in 2015, but where the Liberals were a close second. So they are here to change minds and raise money with an election just nine months away. David Cochran, CBC News, Sherbrooke. China's ambassador to Canada gave a rare interview to reporters today in Ottawa. And he had a warning for our government. Lu Xiaoyu says tensions between the two countries could escalate if Canada continues to rally international support in the dispute over two Canadian men being detained by Beijing. China's spy agency took Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor into custody December 10th, accusing them of endangering state security. Their detentions followed Canada's arrest of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou on an extradition request from the United States. Ambassador Liu says the cases are unrelated. He also commented on the death sentence given to Canadian Robert Schellenberg for drug smuggling. Liu says it is based on Chinese law and that all legal procedures were followed. He stressed that Schellenberg has a right to appeal. Meanwhile, Canada's ambassador to China has a very different message. John McCallum has been briefing ministers on the three Canadians being detained by Beijing. He's urging Ottawa to hold fast to its current approach and keep seeking out support from other governments and international corporations. We have to engage the senior Chinese leaders and persuade them that what they are doing is not good for China's image in the world. It's not good for the image of corporate China in the world. Certain countries are having meetings anyway with Chinese leaders. And if those countries are friends of ours, we would ask them to engage. They are dumpster diving for a good cause. Coming up, the UVic students trying to raise awareness about food waste.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. We appreciate the jury for, for their uh, time and consideration with respect to this matter and for all of those who were involved in bringing this case to this stage. A BC Supreme Court jury has found Gary Handlin guilty of murdering Monica Jack 40 years ago. Handlin sexually assaulted and killed the 12-year-old girl in Merritt in 1978. This is an additional activity to protect our housing sector, which has been buffeted by speculation. Opt out or pay the provincial speculation and vacancy tax by default. That's the reality for 1.6 million homeowners. There's been fierce backlash over the exemption process, forcing the province is defending its rollout. She was kicked out of the library at Metro Town in Burnaby, burst into tears in the parking lot, and emphatically told reporters she's not a racist. A bizarre afternoon involving Karen Wang, the ousted former Liberal candidate in the Burnaby South by-election, who now wants back in the race. Well, it's an alarming and staggering finding. Mm -hmm. More than half of all food produced across our country goes to waste. So says a first ever nationwide survey that studied how food is wasted from the producer all the way to your kitchen table. And it's prompting calls for changes to how edible product is treated in this country, as the CBC's Ron Charles explains. While Canadians have a sense that a lot of food gets wasted, no one has ever before added up all the waste through the entire supply chain. From farms and fishing boats through processing plants to distributors to grocers and to our homes. A study released today suggests the sum of all that waste is astronomical. 58% of what's grown, raised or fished in Canada is wasted. Each year, 11.2 million metric tons is unnecessarily wasted. That's enough food to fill a freight train that stretches from Ottawa to past Winnipeg. Or enough food for every Canadian, rich or poor, to eat for five months. The total financial value of this food is $49 billion. The study for the Toronto Food Rescue Organization Second Harvest is funded by Walmart's charitable foundation and was conducted by a consulting firm that tries to reduce waste in food processing. There is a culture of accepting waste. There is actually, I would actually go to the point, there is a culture in some elements of industry, government and academia of actually thinking that food loss and waste is beneficial because it drives the economy. He says aside from needing to change attitudes about waste, the food industry also needs to stop practices, such as putting best before dates on food that isn't harmful when spoiled. Is that there are businesses who apply purposely conservative best before dates in the knowledge that it's going to drive purchases. But they actually abuse it. He would like to see rules about best before dates tightened and standardized. As well, the study suggests looking at more ways to cut down on waste at all stages of production and to donate food that would otherwise be wasted. Second Harvest and the study authors have a meeting next week to share their findings with federal government officials. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. That's unbelievable. Yeah, it's disturbing. It's actually kind of sad when you think about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Especially when you hear the numbers associated yeah. and, and putting it to a province and, and how big that actually is. It's big food wasters, yes. Yeah. But uh, here in BC, a couple of University of Victoria students are making sacrifices to be part of the solution to all that waste. They've been dumpster diving for more than a week to raise money for food insecure communities. And what they've been able to pull out of the trash may surprise you. Began. Oh, lots of cauliflower. We found gourmet yogurt in the trash, like the ones that come in glass bottles that are $5 each. Gourmet cheeses, gourmet like everything. Wheels of brie cheese, Comox I found. Comox brie cheese. Comox brie, yeah. that is maybe the best. <laughs> for some broccoli today. <laughs> we have been dumpster diving for the past eight days as part of a challenge to ourselves uh, in order to raise money for uh, Northern Food Security Initiatives. Everywhere can be pretty hit and miss, but sometimes we'll just get um, 
indescribable amounts of vegetables and fruits. I dumpster dive almost all of my produce. Um, for other things, uh, it kind of depends, but I'd say more than 50% uh, is reclaimed food for me. Normally it's more than I can consume by myself. And the food we're taking is in great shape. It's stuff that to me looks like it could be on the shelf of a grocery store. I think there's like a misconception yeah. that we're eating scraps, we're eating rotten food, but in reality that's not at all what it is. From now on again there's like a little bruise or like some denting on the produce. Uh, maybe it's uh, a day past the best before date, but it's totally all edible and stuff that shouldn't be in the trash at all. Some stores in Victoria have actually like picked up on the fact that people are dumpster diving and have started to leave out boxes of the food that they, they know is edible just beside the dumpster, which is nice because then it doesn't mix with all the rest of the stuff. You don't have to go in. It's easy to pick through. But that still to me is like, if you know that this food is edible and you know that people are going to look through it, why isn't there another step happening? Why isn't it going somewhere rather than just being left out? We're trying to get not only to stores, but to everyday people that the way that we're consuming things isn't sustainable and the way that our food system is working isn't going to last forever. The fact that we can sit here and hide our eyes from all of this food that's being wasted while other people are, especially in Northern Canada, are not having enough to eat and are going hungry and food insecure is something that shouldn't be a blind spot in our vision, it should be addressed. That really them. puts it into perspective though, yeah, seeing all that. Yeah. Comox Brie. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you're gonna Do you find. know how much that stuff is? <laughs> it's expensive. It's expensive. And I think you know what, the, the best before dates uh, are a big part of this, right? Because mm -hmm. people just, they, they chuck it before it, uh, what gets that? But researchers have said that yeah. best before date isn't always necessarily, it, it's a best before, but it's not necessarily a hard and fast exactly. rule. So. Mm. All right, you are looking, there it is, a live shot at 6.32 on this Thursday evening, Harbor Center with uh, the lights of Gross Mountain. In the background, changes around the corner, not looking pretty weather-wise. Johanna has the full forecast coming up. Johanna Wickstaff is here now. Mm -hmm. We're getting closer to the weekend. Yes. <laughs> I know. We Counting were them down. Same, same thing yesterday, <laughs> but it's even closer today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I do have something for everyone, as I alluded to before. We've got a few showers, but a few sunny breaks. 
The day will start off a little something like this. Let me take you through the time lapse. Uh, gray to kick off your Friday. We do have uh, heavier rain moving in right now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, continuing through tomorrow morning. But as you can see, it was a mild start to the day. Temperatures sort of uh, up around four or five, six degrees before we hit the noon hour. Yes, there were a few sprinkles out there. Dry for most of the afternoon. And now we're really just getting into that second round of heavy stuff. Uh, wind chills across the country. I wanted to show you that again tonight because we are still seeing widespread cold alerts from the prairies through Ontario and Quebec into Atlantic Canada where we are in the deep freeze uh, for a couple of days and really the only place above seasonal today across the country is southern British Columbia. Uh, that is coming with the rain though and you can see those heavier bands now approaching the strait. Uh, get ready for a bit of a downpour in the next hour or so across Metro Vancouver. If you have evening plans, uh, definitely bring the umbrella tonight. It is going to be a soggy overnight, picking up a good 10 to 20 millimeters through to your your Friday morning. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, Friday afternoon, hoping for a bit of a break and then that steadier round moving in towards the afternoon. So a very similar Friday to the Thursday we've just had. Taking you through the overnight, you can see there are those heavier bands showing up in the yellow and the orange pausing you at 6 a.m. Uh, Shower is definitely a possibility across most of Metro Vancouver. We do get that bit of a break though, and again, that hope of just a bit of blue sky before the next round rolls in around uh, 4 or 5 p.m. tomorrow. Coming with some gusty winds as well. Here's Friday, 8 p.m. I find that uh, these forecast winds, instantaneous wind gusts, sort of underplay it at times. So uh, they're picking up about 30 to 40 kilometers per hour. We could see 40 to 50 kilometer per hour gusts tomorrow afternoon. As far as rainfall totals go, 20 to 40 millimeters uh, overnight tonight into tomorrow morning. Maybe double that uh, with that next round that moves in tomorrow evening. So it is a wet uh, next 24 hours, but again, hoping for some breaks in between there. The big picture, we are getting some snow in the interior and we really do need it. I was looking at some of the latest numbers. We know we've been in a snow drought up in the northwest. Prince George starting to really see those uh, snow numbers uh, look a little alarming, but now we're starting to see pockets in the southern interior as well, where we are well below where we should be for snow levels, a little disconcerting as we head closer to uh, the fire season around the corner. So watching things closely, that low pressure system bringing a bit of snow to the interior, as you can see, and the next couple systems will continue to bring that snow. Let's take a look at the long range forecast. We're not getting a ton of the snow though, I should uh, mention just maybe two to five centimeters over the next 24 hours. Back here, look at that, bit of something every single day. Note the milder temperatures over the next three days. I do think we'll see some sun this weekend. I was hoping for an all sunny Sunday, but a few showers sneaking into the latest model run so don't rule that out yet okay things have changed because Monday was looking super sunny there's still a sun icon in there all right it you is it's blue Monday right so you got to have the sunshine <laughs> exactly. so everyone's happy yes some you know what people. some people are gonna do this weekend what they're gonna go play golf no, they're going to take pictures of it. Is that you? Send, no, I'm not oh. going to, but I know some people will. That's so random. No, <laughs> and then they'll send pictures to their friends back east. Yeah, that is right. definitely yeah. going to happen. Yeah. Yes, yeah, be nice enough. when you do it. Yes. Okay, um, residents of Westbrook, Maine, have been kind of mesmerized by an odd sight lately. That's right. Ice discs nearly 100 meters wide rotating in their river. The perfectly symmetrical shape has drawn comparisons to a crop circle, which has some people speculating about alien activity. But scientists say it's a totally <laughs> natural phenomenon. Ice discs form when tiny droplets suspended in the water condense together. And in this case, the river's whirlpool effect created an unusually large condensation of all these droplets. No aliens. Very cool. Coming up. Come Overseas trip cancelled. Why U.S. President Donald Trump has grounded a delegation led by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi.
Nancy Pelosi was all set to board a U.S. military flight to Afghanistan today. But just an hour before the Democratic Speaker of the House was due to leave, she ran into an unexpected and partisan problem. President Donald Trump canceled her trip. The CBC's Paul Hunter explains. It was quickly labeled a childish, petulant, passive-aggressive act of pure retribution, courtesy Donald Trump. It's petty. It's small. It's vindictive. It is unbecoming a president of the United States, but it is a, unfortunately a daily occurrence. As government buses today sat idling on Capitol Hill, waiting for a congressional delegation to begin a trip to go visit U.S. troops in Afghanistan, key among those traveling, senior Democrat and Trump foil Nancy Pelosi, the U.S. president today fired off this letter. I'm sorry to inform you that your trip has been postponed, he wrote, calling it a public relations event that is totally inappropriate. In short, Trump denied Pelosi use of military aircraft. Wrote Trump, Pelosi could always go by flying commercial. We need strong borders. Yes, it all comes back to Trump's demand for that border wall, something he repeated again today. A singular demand that's forced the partial government shutdown that's left hundreds of thousands of U.S. government workers without pay for nearly a month. Trump won't end it unless Democrats agree to fund an extension of the existing border wall, something they see as an ineffective, wasteful way to secure the border. With the two sides dug in on that, Pelosi took a dramatic step yesterday, all but uninviting Trump to this month's big State of the Union address. This is last year's address. Trump's move today is widely seen as payback for Pelosi trying to take this kind of spotlight away from him. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham today called both Pelosi and Trump sophomoric as frustration in an ever more dysfunctional U.S. government grew broadly. Forget games. Forget petty games. Let's sit down and open the government up. There are real people suffering. That report from the CBC's Paul Hunter in Washington. Well, it's back to the Brexit drawing board for Theresa May. The British Prime Minister survived a confidence vote and is now working on Plan B. Parliament delivered a crushing defeat of May's original Brexit deal on Tuesday. She now has just days to accomplish a task that's been in the works for three years. The CBC's Thomas Dagla has the latest. Well, Westminster is still in deadlock, but at least there is a plan for a path forward. The leader of the House of Commons confirming today that Prime Minister Theresa May will return to Parliament on Monday to present her path forward on Brexit. Keep in mind, earlier this week, her plan A, her initial Brexit deal, was voted down by an overwhelming majority here in the House of Commons. And so the next round of voting, the next time MPs are going to get a say on uh, Theresa May's new deal is on January 29th. In the meantime, uh, Theresa May's cabinet is meeting with other parties here to figure out what form of Brexit could get a majority in the House of Commons. The one man conspicuously absent from those talks is opposition leader Jeremy Corbyn of the Labour Party, who says he's not going to sit down to talk with the prime minister until she takes a no-deal Brexit scenario off the table. The starting point for any talks about Brexit must be that the threat of a disastrous no-deal outcome is ruled out, taken off the table, and we can talk about the future of the plans that we will put forward and the future relationship with Europe. But take no deal off the table now, please, <laughs> Prime Minister. The political chaos here in recent days seems to be having an effect on the way people perceive Brexit in this country. A major poll done yesterday and released today shows 56% uh, of voters in this country would choose to remain in the European Union if a um, second referendum were called, 44% choosing to leave uh, the European Union, a reversal of sorts of what happened uh, in the 2016 Brexit referendum. It is the highest result for the Remain side since polling from YouGov has uh, been keeping track of this uh, data since after the referendum in 2016. This was done for the People's Vote campaign, but it remains a reputable polling firm and interesting data in any case. A second referendum is not in the plans right now, but we'll find out in the coming days 
what the government plans to do to get out of this mess. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. A group of Indigenous leaders has won some high-profile support with a plan to buy the Trans Mountain Pipeline from the federal government. Several oil company executives are now backing the idea. Kyle Bax has the report. Those in the oil patch I spoke to think it's a good idea for Indigenous groups to take an equity stake in Trans Mountain. Some say it would be a strong investment, since pipelines are traditionally good money makers. Others say having First Nation owners would improve the pipeline's reputation, showing First Nations do support it. It sends a strong signal across Canada that there is acceptance of that, that there is another side to the, to the story. And uh, I think many parts of Canada, that, that message isn't coming through. More than 130 Indigenous groups are meeting in Calgary to discuss how best to purchase Trans Mountain from the federal government. The contentious expansion of the pipeline is on hold. Further consultation with First Nations is underway, as well as a further assessment of more oil tankers along B.C.'s coast. One First Nation chief said more information is needed about the possible financial arrangement, but he says he's had a positive relationship with the oil industry for decades. That in the 70 years that my tribe has been involved in oil and gas development, not once have we ever harmed any people, any animals. We've not harmed the soil. We've not harmed the waters. We've not harmed the air. Indigenous leaders backing the purchase of Trans Mountain want to present a proposal to the federal government this spring. Considering the difficulty with building pipelines, some only want to deal once construction is well underway. Kyle Bax, CBC News, Calgary. Well, here's something to keep in mind if you're planning a getaway this winter or at March break, perhaps the Zika virus isn't gone. It caused a global health emergency in 2016. Thousands of babies born with permanent disabilities. But doctors warn the danger still persists. Christine Burek has more. Tickets to Guyana for grandma's 80th was the plan until Layla Bast found out she was pregnant and thought, whatever happened to Zika virus? I think it's something that because it's not in the news, it's not really a threat here anymore that it is not thought about and it is a concern for you know people who are going away because I mean it takes one bite that's all it takes well, that, no, a warning simply, etched simply in her memory because Bast was also you know, pregnant three years are, ago when the World Health Organization declared Zika a worldwide emergency pregnant women bitten by Zika infected mosquitoes were giving birth to babies with a brain damaging condition called microcephaly 45 pregnant Canadian women were infected during travel or through sex with an infected partner, and as many as five gave birth to babies with severe abnormalities. But now? Even to bring it up to my doctor, he was quite shocked when I asked him to look into it for me. There are currently more than 80 countries reporting risk of Zika, including popular tourist destinations. The overall burden of the disease is likely much lower now compared to what it was three uh, years ago during the epidemic, but it's certainly not zero percent in many places. So here's the CDC world map, and you can see obviously... Mexico. Oh yeah. Along with countries in the Caribbean and Southeast Asia, including Cuba, the Dominican Republic and India, places pregnant women are advised to avoid and couples who are planning to have a baby should be cautious about. I think these are very good conversations to have with the healthcare provider. Every major outbreak and threat that's happening around the world right now is, is here on this map. Dr. Cameron Kahn has been tracking Zika, among other viruses, for years, even predicting Zika would arrive in the U.S. six months before it did. In India, Zika transmission was occurring, you know, in the fall. He and his team use worldwide data, real-time monitoring and artificial intelligence to fuel this early warning system. He says Canadians shouldn't panic over Zika, but the risk of infection is real. This is one of those situations where the likelihood may be quite low, but the consequence may be quite high. Oh my gosh. A risk that Bast simply isn't willing to take. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Well, a bit of meat, a lot of veggies. That's the diet scientists now say that we should be eating. A new study describes the planetary health diet as a way to maximize health and protect the earth. 
CBC's Dominic Valaitis has the details. Well, the so-called planetary health diet, which was unveiled today in the medical journal The Lancet, has been two years in the making. And the 37 scientists from around the world who are behind it believe it could provide a solution to one of the great challenges currently facing humanity. That is, how to feed the world's growing population a healthy diet without causing damage to the environment. Something scientists say we're simply not achieving at the moment. Now, it may surprise you, but meat is included in this new diet, just not a lot of it. A burger a week or a large steak a month is OK. A couple of portions of fish and chicken a week is also allowed. But the rest of your protein should, if you were to follow this new diet, uh, come from plants. Indeed, the planetary health diet calls for a major push on fruit and vegetables, which should, scientists say, make up half of every plate of food we eat. But not all vegetables are included. Starchy ones like potatoes, for example, are banned. Now, as well as being kinder to the planet and help in meeting a growing demand for healthy food, those behind this new diet say it will also save lives. In fact, scientists believe it will prevent about 11 million people dying prematurely each year from diseases linked to unhealthy diets. Dominic Valaitis, CBC News, London. Well, no one wants police to show up at their party, but for one Regina woman, officers knocking on the door made for a special moment. That's coming up. Friday on the early edition, as BC's overdose crisis heads into its third year, more and more researchers are trying to come up with technological solutions, but just how effective and how accessible is that technology? We'll look at that question. Well, a seven-year-old girl in Nova Scotia has been recognized for her heroism after she helped rescue her family from a near-fatal car crash. Her mother's minivan went off the road, flipped over, and landed in a river. Three children under eight were on board. David Burke brings us the story. If you see anyone else who has a car accident, just make sure you have a seven-year-old or six-year-old to help. Sophia LeBlanc has some good advice for motorists. She would know since she was instrumental in saving her own family from a car crash in November. Her mother, Candace Hicks, was on her way to Oxford when her van hit a rut and she lost control of the vehicle. Um, we hit the guardrail, made a really loud 
the noise. I think we still all have that noise in our head. And um, we flew off into the river. I didn't know how deep it was, so it was I just knew we were going into water. Um, yeah, it was really scary. The van flew over an embankment, flipped, and landed on its roof in a river. Hicks and Sophia managed to crawl out a window, but the other two children were still trapped inside, and one was unconscious. Candace couldn't get her two-year-old unstrapped because her arm was broken, so she got Sophia to do it. I didn't know what to do because I didn't want to leave her standing there in the water and my son unconscious down by the river. So I asked Sophia to, to climb up and wave down a car. The hill was so steep, Sophia had to climb onto her mother's back to get a grip and start climbing out. But I knew I could do, I could do something safely and save my family. So that's why I felt a little like, because I thought I was a little scared. My heart, I think, was being really fast. She managed to flag down help. At the same time, a man living nearby saw what happened and called 911. I didn't figure anybody was going to make it out or too many people weren't going to make it out, but they got lucky. You know, they were really lucky. Terry managed to cut Sophia's brother free from the van. Besides some cuts and bruises, the children are all fine. The RCMP were so impressed by Sophia's bravery, they presented her with an active heroism award. Although Sophia was a bit disappointed when she learned her award might just be a piece of paper. I thought, because I was so brave, I thought I would get something a little better. But Sophia didn't need to worry. The RCMP so and EHS uh, had her covered. Along with the award, she and her siblings also received some new toys. <laughs> David Burke, CBC News, Amherst. Okay, the toys were a must after that. I think so. Yeah, she absolutely. deserved that. Yeah. 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 Well, when the police show up at your party, it usually means it's <laughs> time for everyone to go home. At least that's been my experience. I was just going to say, is this a personal story here? Yeah. <laughs> well, for a woman in Regina, the arrival of the Mounties uh, did make for a very special moment. <laughs> That's uh, Corporal Daryl Chernoff and some other members of the RCMP. They were invited to Elsie Shepard's 100th birthday party this week. When Corporal Chernoff heard Elsie saying she wanted to dance. He asked her son for permission and then took her for, as you see, a turn around the room. Chernoff says it was a special moment for him and he hopes it was for Elsie as well. It Looking looks good. like it was. She yeah. seems to have enjoyed that. Ah, oh, that's nice. I want to hear your story now, so. We'll talk about yeah. it off the camera. <laughs> <laughs> the cop showed up. And the I <laughs> think you two don't have stories like that. No, no. Don't throw me under the bus. <laughs> Nothing. Come on. All right. You can always find our news program online, cbc.ca slash bc. Next local news is with Dan Burrett at 11 o'clock after the National. Just don't hear your story. <laughs> have a good night. Good luck. Good night. <laughs>